Welcome to the Dean's Lecture in Fine Arts. My name is Alana Lindgren, and I'm the Acting Dean in the Faculty of Fine Arts. I would like to acknowledge with respect the Lekwungen peoples, on whose traditional territory the University of Victoria stands, and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanich peoples, whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. On behalf of the Faculty of Fine Arts, I would like to thank Dr. Joanne Clark, the Dean of the Division of Continuing Studies, and her colleagues for hosting the Dean's Lecture Series. It's a wonderful way for us to share our exciting research and creative activity that defines the Faculty of Fine Arts. And I'm particularly pleased to introduce to you today's speaker, Dr. Malia Bally Bowes. Dr. Bally Bowes is an Associate Professor of South Asian Art History in the Department of Art History and Visual Studies. Her research focuses on issues of death, memorialization, gender, and public identity in the early modern courtly and contemporary art and architecture of North India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. She is, and you soon will discover this for yourselves, a rising star in the field of art history. Her publications include Royal Umbrellas of Stone, Memory, Political Propaganda, and Public Identity in Rajput Funerary Art. She is also the editor of Women, Gender, and Arts in Asia, circa 1500 to 1900, and Intersections. Art and Islamic Cosmopolitanism. In addition, she has edited a special edition of Ars Orientalis, which is dedicated to the arts of death in Asia. And she is currently, and I did say she's a rising star, she is currently working on another book titled Gendered Threads of Globalization, 20th Century Textile Crossings in Asia. The title of Dr. Ballybose's lecture today is The Razor's Edge, Gender Politics and Structural Violence in the Work of Bangladeshi Artist Taiba Begum Lipi. I hope you enjoy the Dean's Lecture in the Faculty of Fine Arts. I acknowledge and respect the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory the university stands and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanich peoples whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. I would also like to sincerely thank my dean, the Dean of Fine Arts at the University of Victoria, Dr. Alana Lindgren, and my chair, Dr. Marcus Milwright, Chair of the Department of Art History and Visual Studies, for inviting me to share my research with you. I'm very excited to do so. And my talk today is taken from a chapter on a forthcoming, from a forthcoming volume uh, on women and art and archaeology in Asia that will be published next year with the University Press of Florida. Dappled light winks and dances across the sleek silver surfaces of hundreds of enlaced stainless steel razor blades. Strung together on delicate chains and molded into streamlined posts, a head, and footboard, the blades articulate a life-size double bed. This sculpture, which is entitled Love Bed, is in the permanent collection of the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum in New York City. It was created in 2012 by Bangladeshi multimedia artist Taiba Begum Lippi. Characteristic of her work, Love Bed and its medium are fraught with convoluted semiotics. The sculpture exposes paradoxes in rural Bangladeshi women's lives. The bed of razors is seductive and eerily inviting, yet by virtue of the material's potential to inflict pain and even death, it's also dangerous. Together with tiny golden safety pins, as we'll soon see, razor blades are synecdoches anchored to key events in the artist's early childhood and young adult life. 
For over a decade, Lippi has created dozens of sculptures of feminine domestic objects, and these include, these are three of them, high-heeled shoes, um, a baby pram, a baby cot, as we'll also see bikinis, uh, out of razor blades and safety pins. And she does this to interrogate issues of gender inequality, agency, marginality, and structural violence that inform the quotidian realities of lower and middle class women in her country. So just to really emphasize, these three sculptures are made entirely out of stainless steel razor blades. So I wanna take us on a very brief detour just to make sure that we're all on the same page geographically speaking. So here we are in Bangladesh and what is now Bangladesh is one of the youngest countries in the world. In 1857, it was subsumed into the wider British Empire as part of British-ruled India. Then when India gained independence in 1947, a new Muslim-majority nation, that is, as opposed to Hindu-majority India, was created, and this was Pakistan. So Pakistan was initially a nation divided into an eastern and a western flank with nearly 1,000 miles of India in between. And then fast forward to 1971, East Pakistan fought a bloody nine-month civil war to gain independence and it became the People's Republic of Bangladesh, which it remains today. Now, I want to call your attention to these two images here on the screen. Um, they are very typical landscape scenes of uh, the Bangladeshi countryside. As you can see, it's riverine, it's low, it's tropical. And these are scenes that would be very typical of our artist, Taiba Begum Lippi's childhood. Bangladesh is also one of the poorest nations in the world. And uh, as an aside, I'd like to note that it's probably going to be one of the hardest hit by climate change in the coming years. These are typical street scenes of Dhaka, the capital. In fact, the, the um, countryside is eerily empty because millions of villagers have migrated to Dhaka for higher education and work. Women predominantly move to the capital uh, to work as housemaids or in the garment factories, and men uh, predominantly in construction or as operating rickshaws. Tens of thousands of Bangladeshis, um, especially men, also migrate annually, particularly to other parts of the Muslim world, the Arab world, other parts of Southeast Asia for work. And millions more Bangladeshis, particularly skilled and highly educated um, citizens, migrate uh, to Europe and North America for our work in higher education. So as I will discuss in greater detail momentarily, Bangladesh is a young nation that is truly at a crossroads uh, and it's experiencing pronounced cultural tensions. And as many of you know, uh, art thrives at the interstices of these, um, of such religio-political religio tensions. Numerous contemporary Bangladeshi artists use their art to speak truth to powers responsible for the structural violence that is so prevalent in the lives of lower and middle class Bangladeshi women. And our artist today, Taiba Begum Lippi, is among them. And like so many other radical artists in her country, because her work is so outspoken, Lippi has also received sharp censure and even death threats in her country. Lippi was born the 11th of 12 children in 1969 in the rural northern part of Bangladesh in a, um, in a area called uh, Gaibanda. She was born to a middle-class Muslim family 
And after receiving her BFA and MFA degrees in painting and drawing from the University of Dhaka, Lippi participated in artist residences and exhibited widely throughout Asia, Europe, and North America, particularly the United States. Her creative explorations of what it means to be a woman in a changing Bangladesh and her frank, near-confessional artworks have garnered her both international acclaim and censure. Today, Lippi is arguably the best-known living Bangladeshi artist in the global contemporary art world. She's also a mentor to numerous younger Bangladeshi artists. Her professional accolades include participating in numerous international group and solo exhibitions and projects at venues at such prestigious uh, sites such as Art Basel Hong Kong, India Art Fair, the Venice Biennale, and the Dhaka Art Summit. In 2002, together with her husband, the multimedia artist um, Mahbur Rahman, Lippi founded Brito International Artists Workshop, and today it's now called Brito Artists Trust. And this organization is very important because it's the country's first artist-run nonprofit organization. In 2011, Lippi and Rahman established the first Bangladesh National Pavilion at the 54th Venice Biennale. And this is incredibly significant because in doing so, this drew the contemporary art world's awareness to Bangladesh for the first time. Now, the resolve required to address gender inequality should not be underestimated in a country such as Bangladesh. Their discussions around the body, particularly the female body, its physiology and abuses against it are highly taboo. The few women artists whose work directly engages with the female body and gendered violence, two other women with whom I worked uh, in Bangladesh whose work addresses this, include um, Delara Begum Jolly and Prima Naiza Andalib. Like Lippi, they are routinely subjected to public rebuke and have had their exhibitions closed due to perceived threats to public morality. Now, in Bangladesh, notions of morality are formulated through the matrix of Islam. In the national language of Bangla, the term for shame or modesty, which are considered positive traits, uh, is loja. And this is a really important term that I'll be returning to because it helps us locate Lippi's art in its proper socio-cultural milieu. Although Bangladesh possesses an overwhelming Muslim majority population, it's estimated that the country is 90% Muslim. It was actually founded as a secular state. And in fact, this was promulgated by the 1972 constitution. By the late 1970s, however, Islam was increasingly tethered to politics and widely promoted as inextricable from Bangladeshi nationalism. In 1977, references to freedom of religion were expunged from the constitution and references to God and Islam were added. In 1988, the military dictator Muhammad Ershad declared Islam the official state religion. Now, although the Supreme Court restored the constitutional precept of secularism in 2010, Islam remains today the official state religion. So this waxing and waning of secularism uh, in Bangladesh has grave impacts on religious and social minorities, the lives of many women, and it remains the most definitive source of uh, tension in the nation's politics. Concomitantly, over about the last um, two and a half decades, 
Bangladesh has experienced greater exposure to cultural influence from Western nations. And this comes from Bangladesh's central role in the global garment industry, the wide availability of foreign consumer goods, media and entertainment, and the vast numbers of Bangladeshis that travel and migrate abroad. So as I have argued in um, my publications elsewhere, these two disparate strands, on one hand we've got Islamist and the other global secular, um, they're colliding in contemporary Bangladesh. And artists such as Lippi creatively examine the complexities of identity that are positioned at this sometimes uneasy intersection. In her 2008 Little Learner, which you're looking at now, uh, it's a minute and a half long single channel video with sound. As you can see, the artist sits across from herself at a table. Now, one of the lippies, as you see, the one on the left, is wearing a red dress uh, that is about knee length and it has short sleeves and her hair is fashionably cut in an in a ear length bob. In a young girl's voice, she haltingly reads aloud from a book of children's nursery rhymes in Bangla. Swathed in a shawl cover, uh, that covers her head and shoulders and upper torso, the other lippy reads in Arabic from the open Quran on the stand before her in the same challenged staccato voice. In the droning cacophony of voices, few words are actually intelligible from either language. Drawn from Lippi's experience of learning to read the two languages as a child, this is a scenario that doubtlessly resonates with many Muslims for whom Arabic is not their mother tongue. As children, millions of non-Arabic speaking Muslims throughout the world are taught to read the Quran in the sacred Islamic language of Arabic. But they read it phonetically as a ritual act. And as um, the language, and in cases like Bangla, even the script, are different from their first language, often these little learners do not understand the semantic content of the text, hence my air quotes. The video should also be understood in the context of Bangladeshi primary school education. In it, there are two divergent streams. One is secular, either um, public or private, and the other is madrasa education or um, religious education. Graduates from these two streams typically only come together in university, and their cultural antagonists quite frequently clash at times with violent consequences. The uh, Lippi with her head covered on the right uh, in the video re also reflects the increase in the practice um, of veiling throughout the country. Historian of modern South Asia, William von Skendel, opines that Bangladesh's rising popularity of veiling signals a, quote, public adherence to the new self-assured face of Bangladeshi Islam, end quote. As with several other artworks in which Lippi appears as contrasting cultural topoi, that is, different possibilities of what she could be, many Bangladeshi women viewers of Little Learner doubtlessly identify with these two manifestations. One signifies in the Bangladeshi context, global secular, the other Muslim. Now, of course, I, I really want to um, stress that these two identities are not necessarily mutually exclusive. Millions of Bangladeshis, both within their home country as well as abroad, comfortably integrate these two strands of their identity on a daily basis. However, through her dueling droning voices, in Little Learner, Lippi implies that they do not always comfortably coexist. They may foment what von Skendel terms, quote, the Bangladesh culture wars, end quote. 
Now, as I just noted, Bangladesh had two independences. Uh, the first was from Britain in 1947, uh, after which it became East Pakistan, and then from Pakistan in 1971, and uh, our artist Lippi was two years old then. Both of these independences were marked by pronounced sexual violence. Hundreds of thousands of women were systematically raped, abducted, and forcibly impregnated by soldiers and civilians of the opposing side. Countless women committed suicide to avoid such a fate and the associated stigma. Now, throughout much of South Asia, rape is widely uh, perceived to tarnish a woman's loja. Now, remember, that's this term that can be translated as honor, shame, or morality. While on a greatly reduced scale and far less organized, Instances of structural and sexual violence against women remain commonplace throughout the subcontinent today. Although frequently imbricated, as psychologist and scholar of violence Bandy X. Lee indicates, structural violence is in fact distinct from behavioral violence. Lee defines the former as, quote, the avoidable limitations society places on groups of people that constrain them from achieving the quality of life that would have otherwise been possible. The harm is structural because it is a product of the way we have organized our social world. It is violent because it causes injury and death." End quote. Lee identifies such limitations as, but certainly not confined to, economic, political, cultural, religious, and legal. Their origins lay in institutions and systems that wield authority over vulnerable members of society. Akin to, yet differing subtly from oppression and social injustice, structural violence may be so entrenched in a society that it becomes nearly invisible. And then this makes it all the more challenging to identify and correct. Members of a society are frequently habituated to structural violence. They thus accept manifestations of it as in unavoidable trials to be endured over their own or others' lifetimes. Germane to an analysis of Lippi's art, Lee notes that structural violence often manifests uh, in gender disparities. This may include imbalances in education, healthcare, safety, even nutrition, and of course, money. Other scholars identify gender-based violence including sexual harassment, which as we'll see is an abiding trope in Lippi's art, as a ubiquitous form of structural violence. This is because gender disparities are interwoven into the structural fabric of society. Innumerable women and girls throughout South Asia are, subject, are subjected to uh, sexual harassment on a daily basis. One of the most persistent forms is groping. In a survey conducted by the non-government organization, the NGO Action Aid UK, of, their, um, of the respondents uh, that they polled in Bangladesh, 84% reported having experienced uh, sexual harassment in public. Uh, this includes, but again, is not limited to uh, lewd comments, advances, and groping. Rachel Jukes, who is the director of the UK-based NGO that's called What Works to Prevent Violence Against Women and Girls, notes that in South Asia, quote, gender inequality is so marked, the problem of entitlement is firmly articulated in society there is massive male sexual entitlement. Public spaces are run by men. They perceive an ownership of all public places, end quote. Jukes avows that entrenched social norms embolden men to harass women, often in plain sight. Now, as a corollary, when even public spaces are deemed unsafe, 
families tend to sequester their women and girls at home. Now, um, this then frequently denies them education and quite often um, impacts their mental and physical health. Love Bed and other, Lippi's other razor blade sculptures speak directly to such practices of female sequestration and other forms of structural violence. One of the artist's earliest memories is as a five-year-old child secretly witnessing her sister-in-law giving birth, spying on her. Now, the family lived far from a hospital bed and road conditions were very poor. A midwife was thus called to the family home to perform all of the family's deliveries. The sight of a silver razor blade being boiled in water and then used to cut the umbilical cord remains emblazoned on Lippi's mind. And the incident recalls Freud's concept of the primal scene. However, in this case, rather than witnessing her parents during intercourse, the artist observes the result and consequently comprehends her own entry into the world. The sculpture's shimmering razor blade chains represent generations of daughter-in-law mothers who give birth in their marital bed. The sculpture's media, therefore, uncannily displaces the marital bed as a site of domesticity, intimacy, and comfort. The razors underscore that for rural Bangladeshi women, bed is just as likely a locus of contestation that's fraught with danger and structural violence. The scene that Lippi witnessed as a young girl is far from exceptional in rural Bangladesh. According to a 2016 study, 62% of births occur at home and 56% are performed by midwives or relatives rather than medical professionals. Deliveries are often conducted in unsterile conditions and this, of course, greatly, reduce, uh, greatly increases the risk of child and maternal morbidity and mortality. Several factors account for the prevalence of home births, and chief among them, of course, is the prohibitive cost of a hospital delivery. Socio-religious ideologies also contribute. It is widely held to bring dishonor to both a woman and her marital family if she delivers outside of the home. Now, particularly in rural areas, a woman's modesty, her loja, is a source of cultural capital. And both her, and that, uh, her own cultural capital as well as her family's. Rural women are therefore encouraged to participate in the Muslim cultural practice of keeping parda. Now, literally meaning curtain, parda refers to female sequestration within the home or being completely covered if a woman does leave the home. And this would then shield her from the gaze of unknown men. As there are comparatively few female gynecologists in rural Bangladesh, it's likely that a hospital birth will necessitate an unknown man seeing the, the mother's reproductive organ. For many women and their families, this would compromise their loja and their cultural capital. Another deterrent is the possibility of a cesarean section in a hospital birth. Um, this is why cesareans are widely held uh, to be unnatural and thus disreputable. The majority of rural Bangladeshi women are uninformed of the risks of home births performed by midwives with little or no medical training. And as an aside, I should note that the literacy rate in Bangladesh is about 62%. And in rural areas, the gender gap in literacy can be as high as about 12%. Educated women are reported to be far more likely to elect to deliver in a hospital. 
However, irrespective of finances or education, uh, for many women, the decision is not theirs to make. In the joint family household, which is the most common living arrangement in rural parts of the country, elder men are the primary decision makers. And in such cases, women often have little agency in decisions of where or by whom their deliveries are performed. The Dhaka Art Summit is one of the largest art festivals in Asia. It's held every other year in the capital of Dhaka. In 2014, the Dhaka Art Summit attracted nearly 70,000 visitors, and these were comprised of visitors from both Bangladesh as well as abroad. That year, Lippi created the installation called A Room of My Own. In the center of the gallery, what you're looking at, uh, atop a platform that was flooded by unfiltered light, plasticine molds of the artist's hands, so those are casts of her own hands, uh, reached into a glass tray that was filled with tampons and forceps. The walls of the exhibition were hung with ultrasound printouts, so that's what you see on the bottom, and uh, the ultrasound printouts were framed by enlaced razor blades. And uh, on, on the upper part, um, what you see are um, photos of the artist's face twisting in pain. Within the exhibition, there was also a bulging pregnant midsection. And as you can see, the, um, it's articulated by the forms of sanitary pads that are comprised of tiny golden safety pins. What you also see is one of several vitrines that were mounted on the wall filled with baby clothes. A Room of My Own documented a devastating, intensely personal occurrence, and that was the artist's late-term miscarriage of her only child. The event nearly killed her two years prior. Lippi was treated over the course of several days in a government hospital. Uh, she was treated for severe infection and um, great blood loss. And the tampons and the sanitary pads were used to absorb the excess blood. Uh, and the photographs were self-portraits she took during the ordeal. The unworn baby clothes, including, as you can see here, bibs that read, Mommy Loves Me, and others read, Daddy Loves Me. Um, these were gifts that the expectant parents received uh, in a shower just days before the miscarriage. Uh, this is a work from the same series, although it wasn't, um, it wasn't displayed at the Dhaka Art Summit that year. It's called My Daughter's Caught, and uh, it's also made of uh, these enlaced stainless steel razor blades. Particularly when considered in light of the artist's own observation of the primal scene, which I just mentioned um, a minute ago, the title and the highly expository nature of A Room of My Own evokes what psychoanalyst uh, Ronald Britton terms the other room. Britton describes the concept as, quote, the setting for the invisible primal scene of infancy, end quote. So uh, according to Britton, the primal scene is this liminal mental site of both imagination and, uh, in terms of the parental bedroom, a site of memory. Lippi's other room is a site of trauma and wonder. And then decades later, it also became a locus of loss and physical pain. As art therapists have identified, for many artists, this other room is a domain of contemplation. It is a creative mental space where the artist negotiates their relationship with their potential artwork. Lippi mined her other room to create her intensely controversial 
a room of my own. Why is it controversial? Well, miscarriage, both natural and induced, is a highly marginalized artistic uh, subject throughout the world. Um, Frida Kahlo, Tracy Emin, and Tabitha Moses are among the very few artists that um, have documented their experiences of, of their losses in their art. Now, regardless of how much these artists wanted the babies that they were carrying or not, as, um, as uh, in Emmons case, and how much physical and emotional pain that they endured, I would argue that for a Mexican artist and um, two British women respectively, somewhat more, at least socially, was at stake for Lippi. Now throughout South Asia, one of the first questions routinely posed to a woman is, how many children does she have? Particularly in rural areas, childless women are subjected to intense scrutiny and distrust. The condition is widely regarded as a tragedy for a couple, and it brings particular social stigma to the wife who carries the brunt of the blame. <clears throat> and uh, in many rural Bangladeshi villages, childless women are ostracized as they are believed popularly to bring ill luck. Quote, even a fox or a dog does not eat the dead body of a childless woman. This is a, um, a well-known rural proverb that Lippi very likely heard as a child growing up in rural Gaibanda. In a country where, for most women, fertility is one of the only paths to symbolic capital, the concept of voluntary childlessness is incomprehensible to many. Pierre Bordeaux describes symbolic capital as, quote, accumulated prestige and the acquisition of a reputation for competence and an image of respectability and honorability, end quote. Motherhood is widely held as a duty to a woman's marital family. A mother, especially of sons, gains immense symbolic capital. The empty baby cot and self-portraits are a public admission of the agony the artist endured. They're also a frank acknowledgement of what many Bangladeshis would consider Lippi's diminished symbolic capital. With a room of my own, uh, Lippi brought one other gendered, highly taboo subject, quite literally, into the spotlight. The tampons and sanitary pads are indexes of menstruation. Throughout South Asia, menstrual blood is uh, not just taboo, but it, uh, even more than that, it's popularly held to be unclean and polluting. Women are widely regarded as uh, impure or shorir korap, uh, which is sick in Bangla during their menstruation. Menstruating women are pro uh, popularly excluded from praying, uh, from performing household tasks, participating in community activities, and often denied protein-rich or nutritious food during uh, their menses. For Lippi to visually announce her miscarriage and to acknowledge the index of female fertility, that is menstruation, of course, in such a public place as the Dhaka Art Summit, I think that really demonstrates exceptional fortitude and audacity. I think it's incredibly brave. Lippi's installation sculpture, Comfy Bikinis of 2012, is comprised of four delicate lace-like bikinis fashioned from tiny polished golden safety pins. They flicker and reflect the light as they dangle from hangers. Contrary to the associations of carefree youth and leisure most commonly assigned to bikinis, 
As with many of the artist's works, Comfy Bikinis offers an uncanny, dark social commentary through its medium. In Lippi's sculptures, safety pins condense domesticity, sexual violence, and the possibility of women's retaliatory agency. Now, Dhaka, the Bangladesh capital, is one of the most densely populated cities in the world. And cast your mind back to a few um, slides. I showed you those images of Dhaka. In rural areas, sexual violence is predominantly confined to the domestic sphere. However, in cities throughout the subcontinent, Sexual predators routinely take advantage of the anonymity afforded by the tangle of limbs and lack of visibility in overcrowded buses, bazaars, and streets. In such areas, they frequently grope, fondle, and even violently pinch the breasts and buttocks of unknown women. Their behavior is particularly rampant on buses. According to the NGO ActionAid UK, half of the women that they had interviewed um, in Bangladesh reported to being regularly groped on buses. At 19, Lippi moved across the country to pursue her art studies in Dhaka. There, she too was introduced to this manifestation of structural violence. As with other forms of structural violence and issues pertaining to the female body, public groping is a largely unacknowledged, unspoken taboo subject. With no alternative means to reach work or school, women are compelled to endure this almost inevitable violation on a daily basis. Their only recourse is to arm themselves with safety pins to stab the disembodied wandering hands that assaults them on the ride. The sexually harassed passenger's choice of defensive weapon is significant, and that's because safety pins are, of course, um, the, the most ubiquitous um, item in a South Asian woman's toilet. For example, numerous safety pins are required to fasten the folds of a sari, and this is the most common garment throughout the subcontinent for married and professional women. Oh, this is a, um, a detail of a comfy bikini top here. In her commodity series of 2010, Lippi juxtaposes razor blades and safety pins. These are the two synecdotal signs associated with her own experiences of gendered violence. Commodity one, which you see on the left, combines acrylic paint, sequins, and safety pins on canvas to articulate a slender young woman's back clad in a comfy bikini top. She stands in a, uh, against this assault of razor blades, straight razors. Now on the right is commodity three, and it offers the midsection of a young woman clad in comfy bikini bottoms. She's positioned against a hot red background that is swirling with sperm. Both of these works emphasize the commodification of young women's bodies as objects of sexual desire available to be touched without invitation and for reproduction. Like Love Bed, Comfy Bikinis, and works from Lippi's Commodity series entwine domesticity and structural violence in a tangled matrix of paradoxes. In Lippi's safety pin artworks, the softest and most intimate parts of the female body, associated directly with reproductivity, are enveloped in cold, sharp chainmail. She reproduces pins from the domestic to the defensive, and in doing so, Lippi provides her fictive wearer, or perhaps herself, with the requisite gendered armor for urban living in Dhaka. For nearly a decade, Lippi has used her art to expose persistent, 
yet unaddressed manifestations of structural violence in her country. Razor blades and safety pins are synecdoches con connoting structural harm in the guises of marginality, danger, physical pain, and assault against women. Lippy harvests from her own experiences of witnessing and experiencing structuring structural violence. However, these experiences undoubtedly resonate with women across the subcontinent and far beyond. Perhaps the greatest challenge to overturning systems of structural violence is identifying their origins and perpetrators. I want to um, wrap up with, uh, to, by returning to Bandy X. Lee, who asserts, quote, structural violence is subtle, invisible, and accepted as a matter of course. Even more difficult than uh, detecting this type of violence is assigning culpability, for the actors are often difficult to identify." End quote. Dangerous and painful deliveries, her own miscarriage, and the public groping she endured as a student are all taboo subjects, the public acknowledgement of which many Bangladeshis would consider compromising to a woman's loja. However, by drawing attention to them, Lippi takes nascent yet significant steps to bring to light practices that cause physical and mental harm to women. She transforms what Lee describes as the subtle, invisible, and accepted as a matter of course into life-size works of art whose delicate, light, reflective media attract the eye and provoke questions of their signification. And taking great risk by publicly acknowledging her experiences, particularly at such prestigious venues as the Dhaka Art Summit and the Guggenheim Museum, Lippi frankly gives forms to these unspoken abuses, enabling them to be spoken and perhaps even ultimately corrected. Thank you.